Canada has over a million kilometers of roads, enough to wrap around the Earth 25 times. Even though we associate the road with human freedom and mobility, you know, it's, it's really the exact opposite in a lot of ways, right? I mean, okay, you think that roads are a source of freedom? Well, try getting around, you know, Dallas, Texas without a car, uh, right? That, that roads, you know, that roads really constrain our lives. I mean, think about, you know, the, the, the countless hours that we spend sitting in traffic, right? I mean, again, we, you know, we think about roads as being sources of mobility, but in some ways they're kind of trapping us in these, you know, these, these networks of, uh, of, of freeways as, as well. So just as roads are destroying the lives of wild creatures, they're destroying our own, our own lives as well. An estimated 14 million birds die here from roadway collisions every year. In southeastern Ontario, scientists have estimated that a 37-kilometer section of highway kills an average of 75 vertebrates daily and over 16,000 animals annually. Cars, trucks, other fast-moving vehicles uh, impact the smallest salamanders and western toads, all the way up to some of the biggest land species like moose, bison, uh, grizzly bears. The sad story is that we're not actually sure how big of an impact that is. We have an idea, but because a lot of those collisions go unreported and a lot of the road kills sort of go off to the bushes and aren't seen by people, um, we're not 100% sure of how many animals are actually killed on, on any road. Roads also impact wildlife through habitat degradation, fragmentation, and barrier effects. These barrier effects prevent animals from moving across the landscape. When large expanses of habitat are cut up into smaller little sections, um, little islands that aren't connected anymore, that's called fragmentation. And roads are one of the reasons that that can happen. And scientists have shown that roads prevent species like wolverines and grizzly bears in particular from finding their mates. The roads actually divide the family trees. Um, you know, they split up their, their genetic um, histories basically. And so worldwide, not just in the Yellowstone to Yukon region, uh, roads are one of the biggest barriers to wildlife movement and finding mates and food. We've all seen the dead deer elk by the side of the highway. It's a very conspicuous, visible manifestation of the problems that roads cause. You know, what we don't see are all of the animals that can't access huge swaths of potential habitat because of roads. Many of these migratory herds of, you know, mule deer, for example, I mean, they can handle some collisions, right? You know, it's not necessarily roadkill that, you know, wipes out a whole migratory herd. It's, it's that loss of access to critical winter habitat that the barrier effect of traffic inflicts on them. So, you know, again, I mean, even, even more deadly than crossing roads in some ways is not crossing roads at all. The takeaway is that animal strikes are an expensive road safety issue, but a preventable one. Animals also experience habitat degradation due to rail tracks. Trains can even introduce exotic species, which can in turn threaten native populations. Tracks constitute an attractive area to large mammals looking for food. For example, Bears feed on carcasses of runover animals or eat plants growing on the railway verges. Roads generally, you know, aside from the highway, bears move down them as travel corridors um, and they do the same on, on the railway. They move down the railway as a travel corridor. There's also um, ungulates like uh, elk and deer that have been killed along the railway as well. So the bears will feed on them. And then uh, as a consequence, they the bears get hit as well. So there's kind of this cycle. Um, there's also grain on the railway in some in some pieces that hasn't been that closely looked at in, in our area, but it has in Banff where there's a lot more grain spillage and definitely attracts ungulates. You can walk onto the rail anywhere here though and you can find little bits of grain almost during the along the whole stretch of the railway. The collisions uh, on the railway tend to happen at night and usually in areas where the um, railway is sort of pinched against a river or somewhere where the bear would kind of get freaked out the train's coming and start running down the, the rail and not and feel like it can't get off the railway and then the train just sort of overtakes the bear. Oceanic vessels present a number of risks to wildlife, 
including collisions, deliberate and accidental chemical pollution, and noise pollution. Marine mammals such as whales, dolphins, sea lions, seals, walruses, and sea otters are particularly vulnerable to the dangers presented by ocean traffic. So there's a literal collision in the overlap between a vessel traffic and the whales, but there's also the impacts of noise. So this is very well understood with the endangered southern resident killer whales that on top of all the other stresses they're experiencing, prey shortage, contaminants in their bodies, that the noise is cumulative on top of that. Yeah, the stresses from that are going to exacerbate other problems. The marine mammals are living in a world of sound. The ocean is a sound trap. And we are injecting this noise in there and that they rely on the noise in everything from socializing, mate selection, depending on, on the species, to finding prey through echolocation, again, depending on what marine mammal species, to communicating, to navigating. Freshwater biodiversity and freshwater species are showing some of the steepest declines um, amongst any other biodiversity. So right now, I believe it's over 84% of freshwater species have been lost since the 1970s. This is more than both terrestrial and marine species, um, and it doesn't get talked about too often. One of the major causes of habitat and wildlife endangerment in Canadian waterways comes in the form of boating. Boats used for transportation, movement of goods, and leisure cause significant dangers to wildlife and affect the quality of water. The depth disturbance of wake boats is also very extreme. Anywhere from six to eight meters below the surface of the water is getting stirred up by that wake boat. Um, you know, when we take it salmon bearing streams and rivers into account many of them which do have wake boat use on them uh, these rivers are typically less than 600 meters across and less than six meters deep so in those areas that provide habitat to a lot of critical species such as salmon which of course have numerous cultural values and economic values it's a huge impact Bird and mammal aviation strikes in Canada have increased nearly every year since 2005. These peaked in 2019 at 2,043 bird strikes and 108 mammal strikes. Birds often congregate in the grassy fields surrounding airports, where they feed, rest, and sometimes nest. Other species such as moose, deer, coyotes, rabbits, bats, and frogs are also susceptible to aviation collisions in Canada. Although high fencing is common surrounding major airports, smaller airfields may not have the resources to fully enclose runways. Float and bush planes are common in the rural regions of Canada. They often take off and land in remote areas where few to no measures are available to protect the wildlife and the aircraft. Although they account for a relatively small percentage of Canadian aircraft, float and bush planes travel to areas of the country with the greatest concentrations of wildlife. Despite steep challenges, there are solutions to mitigate damage from human transit lines across natural environments. Some of these efforts are already yielding promising results. 
Given that 90% of all lake biodiversity depends on the foreshore at either one or all life stages, uh, promoting protection of these shorelines and foreshores around Canadian lakes has never been more important than it is today. Protecting lakes within this country can't fall on just one organization or government or individual. It has to be all hands on deck if we're going to save these incredible ecosystems now and into the future. Um, and it is the responsibility of each and every one of us as a resident within this country to act as a local lake steward and be active within our environment. To mitigate the dangers to wildlife posed by marine vessels, Speeds can be regulated, particularly in areas with higher populations of threatened species. Acoustic and thermal sensors can alert vessels to the presence of whales. Shipping routes can be plotted to avoid areas frequented by marine mammals and threatened species. Education for vessel operators can improve awareness of the risks of ship strikes. So a huge part of it is education, and that includes knowing signs of presence and knowing signs like, or, or areas of density, which is very much we as the Canadian Pacific Comeback Collaboration, what we are working on. So there is absolutely, in terms of education, much more that can be done in understanding why there is such a strong risk of collision. If more people understood why the whales need it to be more quiet in the ocean that would really help in like people understanding why they need to slow down and why they need to give whales space vessel noise can be reduced by regulating speed in protected areas and regions with high numbers of marine animals technological advancements can also be employed in the design of marine vessels and watercraft to reduce noise several wildlife solutions for rail are available. Sound signaling enforces associative learning among nearby wildlife. Meanwhile, supplemental feeding stations can be placed far from railways to influence animal movement in the opposite direction. Targeted reduction of train speed during migration periods can reduce mortality rates. To minimize the negative impacts of roadways, transportation and government agencies have introduced a variety of wildlife-friendly infrastructure projects. It's, it's a lot easier to mitigate a road if it's just if, by avoiding building it. You know, we know there's not going to be an impact if we just don't build it. So, um, yeah, I think maybe the general public voicing their concerns for creating more roads and maybe um, we need to have a little bit more of a of a broad scale planning um, to to reduce our our reliance on on roads and try to increase more public transit and things like that. Um, and where we do have roads that are running through sensitive habitat, then we should be you know having formal budgets for for mitigating these things. So the vast majority of wildlife vehicle collisions can be prevented with safe driving. Um, so if you're driving, reduce your speed. Speed increases um, like stopping distance. It, increases, it decreases your ability to react um, in a timely manner. So if wildlife jumps out on the road and you're going super fast, you don't really have a lot of time to, to figure out how you're going to deal with that situation. Um, so reducing your speed, driving defensively, scanning the roadsides for wildlife at all times, just always making sure that you know, when you're driving, you're actively watching the roads for wildlife. The good news about wildlife crossing structures is that they work. Once more in Western Canada, research has shown that animals not only use the overpasses, but in some cases, as with bears, they've even demonstrated a genetic exchange across a major highway. What that means is that animals are moving across the highway, using the crossing structures, and breeding with individuals on either side of the roadway, allowing for a continuous exchange of genetic information. For my research, I completed an inventory and found 120 wildlife overpasses across the globe. For me, it was amazing and really inspiring to see over 120 examples of transportation professionals and different agencies coming together 
to build these structures, explicitly for the use of animals. It's got to be one of the first times in history where humanity has come together to build so much infrastructure strictly for wildlife.